Hi, it's John from Dyna Spectrum. This video is about port injection. We did a previous one, part one, on direct injection. This is a moderately advanced topic. Anyone's welcome to watch, but there is some complexity. So um, let's see how we go. DASA does include a small port injector on each cylinder. Uh, I've not had them flow tested. I've not seen any official data on what they flow. Estimates vary between about 180 and 210 cc per injector. Maybe somebody that knows can tell us exactly what they actually are. Um, the main control variable is the fuel share that's delivered through the port injectors. Excuse my typo there. This is as a percentage, so 50% at very low loads is common in some modes. Zero coming up to medium engine load and then 5% at high loads. But what seems clear is that the standard 400 horsepower can be delivered just through the direct injectors and you get most power generally by delivering all the fuel you can through the direct injectors but as we covered in our previous video um, you can run out of direct injector and high pressure fuel pump quite rapidly and so although the manufacturer probably added these for emissions many DASA tuners and users used them to get a lot more fuel in and then rather than messing around with 5%, they can get 50% or more of the fuel going in through the, uh, through the port injectors. A uh, couple of quick bits of info on the calculations, which uh, look complicated, but actually, you know, they're not. We talked about engine load in a previous video, and it's considered to be the fresh air mass that's trapped in the cylinder relative to normally aspirated. So we established there that 200 load would typically be about 1.3 bar of boost or about 19 psi. To get fuel mass, you take that engine load and you divide it by the lambda target. So a typical lambda target would be somewhere in the 0.8s. So if you take the engine load and you divide it by 0.8, for example, you're actually multiplying it by 1.25. So the fuel mass is going to be a little bit higher as a percentage. So say if you had 240 load, divide that by 0.8, then your fuel mass is going to be 300, isn't it? What's then done is that you take that fuel mass and you take the percentage of the share that's to go through the ports, such as 5%, 50%, whatever, and then you multiply that by the port injector scaling to get the direct injector time. You take that same fuel mass, but you take the direct share, which is 1 minus the port share, and you multiply that by the direct injector scaling. After that, latency for battery voltage is added on, and there are a couple of other compensations in there as well, so that the ECU actually adjusts the injector pulse widths based on the low fuel pressure for the port injectors and from the high fuel pressure for the direct injectors. And then there's also adjustments to fuel trim. In our XDF, we call the injector scaling values conversion of relative fuel mass, RK, to effective injector time. And people that like Bosch acronyms will probably know these as K-R-K-A-T-E and K-R-K-A-T-E-P-F-I. I just call them K-R-K and K-R-K-P-F-I. A couple of contingencies as to what happens in extreme circumstances. It, it does appear that the ECU doesn't do anything if the pulse would end up too long. And if you go too long on the direct injectors, as we discussed in the direct injector video, you impinge on the ignition and you get a misfire. If you go too long on the port injectors, nothing like that particularly happens, except that if your fuel mass calculation suggested that you needed that length of injector that can't be delivered, then you will eventually go lean and then the lambda short term fuel trim We'll add or subtract 25% to try and fix that. And after a while running at those extremes, it would show a fuel trim fault. Really, the aim is to get the Lambda short term fuel trims close to one as possible. Um, anything from 0.9 to 1.1 is OK on a fairly heavily modified car where the air calculations might not be accurate. But you can get it better than that. And it's worth putting some effort into doing so. Right, let's have a look at some tables and a data log. So what I'm going to do is switch to a DS1 that I've actually got on this network and try something live, which I hope works. So what we're going to do is uh, open the browser. 
well we actually need to exit our presentation first let's go to the browser and go to ds1.local and there we've got our ds1 on this network it's running in its obd app i'm going to grab a few assets from this from the file tab so that i can open the stock and the modified tune that we have been using so in the file tab here i'm going to grab the xdf and that's saved here. I'm going to open that and then I'm going to extract and unzip that so that we can use that in a moment. I'll leave that in my downloads folder. And I'm also going to download the stock calibration so you can see the stock values. And also I'm going to grab OTS stage two, which is designed for stock port injectors. Okay, now I'm going to open Tune and try and load these things in. So in our downloads folder, here's the most recent. So we'll grab this XDF and then we'll load the binary. We'll load the stock file here and also we'll load as a compare file our stage two, which is here. Now, if we go down to the FlexFuel map switch folder, here you can see, let's have a look in map switch one, which is designed for 93 octane blended with ethanol. We've got conversion of relative fuel mass here that I was talking about earlier. This is the one for the port injectors. So since this is based around stock injectors, this is a stock value and the ethanol value for this in the modified ECU is 52%, 53% higher because that's what E100 needs compared with E0. And for the direct injectors, we have the same values same table names or similar table names except these don't say PFI in them uh, so the one for gasoline here in the stock is this value here and we haven't modified it in the stage two that's what we're comparing with for ethanol again we've got the stock value and then we've multiplied that by 1.53 for E100 and what that means is that anywhere between E0 and E100 we're correctly scaling those relative fuel mass calculations into inject pulse widths to try and get the land uh, short-term fuel trims close to one as possible. Let's anyway move on to the other tables here, of which there are two, one, one each for gasoline and ethanol. So these are stock values this is the 50% that I referred to at idle as the share. So RPM is on the Y axis and target engine load is on the X axis. And for ethanol as stock, it's the same. For There's another set of these as well. I mentioned that sometimes it runs 50% at idle and sometimes it doesn't. So there are two different types of these tables. Here are the two variants. All the other ones are collapsed into these so that you just need to tune the pair that are different. What we actually do with larger injectors is put these to zero at idle as well because the injector pulses for large injectors can be a bit touchy sometimes. And so we just bring in the port injectors at higher loads across here. Let's show you now some modified values. In Tuner Pro, when you've got a table up like this, you can click the scales here to show the binary that you're comparing it with. And in this case, you can see that for gasoline, we've put 10% in here instead of 5%. And we've also changed the y-axis to get a bit more resolution where we needed it. Quite oddly, these tables are not interpolated from the factory because they're all just filled with 5% or zero, and it doesn't really need them. But it does mean that then when you have values that vary from cell to cell, you can actually get a bit of a jump. It doesn't affect how the car runs, but it doesn't look as pretty in logs as you would expect with an interpolated table. 
and these are the only tables I can think of off the top of my head that aren't interpolated. So you should be aware of that, but it's not necessarily a problem. So let's look at the modified ethanol table. So this is stock. We click the scales and we get the modified values, which are quite different here. So you can see that we're running at 2,500 RPM. We're asking for nearly 0.4, 40% of our fuel to come through the port injectors. And that's really because ethanol typically requires, you know, for E100, just, just over 50% more fuel to get the same lambda. And so we are really putting in most of the extra fuel that we need for ethanol through these port injectors. You can see at higher up where we've got less time available for the port injectors to deliver that they're actually contributing less of a share, 0.3 or 30 percent, because otherwise you would just max them out. And if you end up with values too high in here, as I said earlier, what will happen is that the fuel will not be delivered that you're asking for, and you'll just end up with lambda short-term fuel trims that then stress the direct injectors harder. So it's better to get these values about right, which have been based on logging and testing for this particular setup. So what I'm going to do now is jump to a log, and because that's running E80, would happen there is that we'd be taking the modified IE stage 2 values and we'd be taking at typical loads that we're going to be using on stage 2 we'd be taking a blend of 10% share on gasoline and 30 to 40% on ethanol and at E80 we'll be taking 80% of the way between gasoline and ethanol so we'd expect values to be getting on for these. So what I'm going to do now in my downloads folder, I also have a log. So we're going to open that. When a log loads, unless you've got an up-to-date template, which we are going to make for the, the latest DS2 logging, you don't see anything, so I'm going to bring up a few items here. If I hit E, I'll get engine speed. Um, hit the down arrow to zoom out. You can see here what looks like a pull through a couple of gears. So let's have a pedal there. So in red, we've got a pedal. We can see it's 100%. So this is a full throttle pull through the gears. You can always bring up throttle to see what the actual throttle was doing. There we go. And... In this case, apart from during a gear change or just after one, um, we have pretty much full throttle all the way between. You can get these tiny little green dips at the top where the throttle is just uh, adjusting position gently, but that doesn't affect the, the actual boost pressure that the inlet manifold sees. Uh, I'm going to take that away for clarity again. Um, let's bring up some other graphs and show you here as we go through this pull some of the split between port and direct. So this value is the equivalent to what was looked up from those blending tables that I showed you before, i.e. these. And you can see that in the mid-range it's up just over 30% and then at high RPM it's down to 26%. This particular setup is running E80, E81. So you can also see the steps that I mentioned here because it isn't interpolated. I'm going to bring up here as well the port injector time, PFI final injector time. And you can see it here in milliseconds. Uh, let's go to 6000 RPM. There we are. You can see there's actually just about to be a step here at 6,000 RPM because the, this port blending table is not interpolated. So just over 6,000 RPM, we've dropped to 20.3 milliseconds. So anyone that's tuned port injector cars will know that 20 milliseconds is 100% injector duty cycle at this point. So basically we're running these port injectors wide open. And you can see at lower RPM, we're using quite generous injector times because basically we'll want these port injectors to be 
taking the strain because we found that if we didn't on stage two then the high pressure fuel pump would tend to crash. We did however find that with this combination and careful setting of load limits so that for example at E80 or E85 or even E90 the engine load would be limited to avoid stress in the fuel system too much but we let everything rip up to E62. So you can see here, if we bring up another graph, the actual high fuel pressure stays at around 24 megapascals, which is its target. All the way through this pull, there's no dips during gear changes or similar. Uh, let's add some more for the direct injector time. And we'll sit that next to the port injector time. So here that's in yellow, you can see 6, 6.3 milliseconds as it's going through. You could run more through those, but the problem is that there isn't a huge amount left on the high pressure fuel pump here. If you look at the high pressure fuel pump delivery angle, yeah, it's up at 86, 85, 86 there. It can go up to 98.5, but it isn't really linear. And if you just push a little bit harder, you sit on 98.5, and then what can happen is the high fuel pressure crashes. So, so we've we've got this here with a little bit of a safety margin, with a margin for cold weather, properly blended with the flex fuel, using the port injectors to their max. And the consequence of all of that that you want to see at the end is your air fuel ratio. So let's make another graph of lambda. So lambda actual, and if you have a look here, so about 0.82-ish. If we look at the lambda set point in red, lambda 0.82 set point, and the lambda actual is moving gently around it, and hopefully it's not using much lambda short-term fuel trim to achieve that. Yeah, you can see the yellow lambda short-term fuel trim here. It's just a few percent either side of one as it goes through the pool. Five percent there, that's okay. It has a range of plus or minus 25 percent. So this yellow value could go from 0.75 to 1.25. So you can see here that the way we've overall blended the port injectors with the direct injectors that we've got the low fuel pressure system taking up its share that everything is nicely trimmed, everything's nicely neutral with a huge margin for error, good clear diagnostics if anything goes wrong and you've got a smooth, safe, powerful and effective result. Thanks very much.